We are here talking about taking our photography underwater with Larry Cohen and Olga Tori. Uh, two underwater photographers who have a very jam-packed session for us tonight. A lot of information. I know I'm curious to hear about it. I know everybody out there is as well. So that being said, I'm going to turn our time over to Larry and Olga. We're going to be talking about underwater. Well, we want to welcome everybody to our first Zoom presentation for B&H. Uh, during the day, I work at B&H answering questions in chat and email. And photography has always been our passion, especially underwater photography. So there are many cameras that are suitable for shooting underwater. Small digital cameras has made underwater photography available to every budget. Mirrorless cameras are smaller but offer more flexibility. Both crop sensor and full frame DSLRs are also very popular. And the same with crop sensor and full frame mirrorless cameras. When picking a camera to use underwater, you need to look for certain features. It's really not that different than picking a camera for land shooting. The size of the sensor is important for image quality. Also, the size of the sensor will determine what lenses we're gonna use on interchangeable lens cameras. And even point and shoot cameras should allow you to shoot in a manual mode. <clears throat> Make sure someone makes a housing for the camera you pick. That sounds simple, but we get asked every day for housings for cameras that there is no housing. Icolite produces housings for more point and shoot cameras than any other manufacturer. And Fantasy produces housing for a few select point and shoot cameras that are every good for underwater uh, imaging. Some camera manufacturers, including Canon, uh, Sony and Olympus produce housings. These housings tend to lack some of the features needed for serious underwater work. Sea Life also produces a few underwater cameras. This includes the Micro 3. This is a small camera that's totally sealed, so it's impossible to flood. And flooding is always a possibility and something we have to deal with. Fantasy also has some nice housings for Sony Crop sensor cameras. Olympus produces a few housings for their mirrorless cameras. Some models are designed with an interchangeable port like this one, while others have a built-in port. And we'll go over why that's important in a bit. Now, Aquatech produces housings to be used on the surface, but not underwater. They're used a lot for surf photography and for swimming events at the Olympics. They are rated to 33 feet. The Aquatech Elite line allows access to important camera controls. The Aquatech base housings are less money, but allow only control to the shutter release. They also produce uh, a housing for iPhones. The phone housing is also rated to 33 feet. The material the housing is made of is also very important. Besides making sure that there is a housing for your camera, you need to make sure it is designed for your needs. Aluminum housing, like the ones we sell from Aquatic and CNC, are rated to 300 feet or deeper. And if you're doing a technical diving, you need this one. Polycarbonate houses, like the ones we sell by Icolite, are rated to 200 feet. This is fine for recreational diving that has a depth limit of 130 feet. Now is the perfect time to buy a new housing. Aquatica is having a very good sale. The best price is in effect till July 31st, 2020, and the sale goes on until April 30th, 2021. So the first rule of underwater photography is to get close. Even clear water has particles in it, and water is denser than air. And the closer you are, the better the image quality. When shooting underwater with interchangeable lens camera, you need to shoot macro for small subjects and wide angle for larger subjects. The size sensor in your camera will influence the lens you use. 100 millimeter macro lenses are good for full frame cameras. 
60 millimeter macro lenses are good for crop sensor cameras. This way, if you see a medium sized subject, it could pull back and still get the shot. Macro lenses produce a one to one, the life size image. Most housings do not include a port. You need to buy a port to match your lens. Everything looks 25% larger and closer underwater. This is an advantage when shooting macro, so we use flat ports. You might need an extension between the port and the housing. If you want to shoot manual focus, you will need a ring on the lens. Most point and shoot cameras have a very good macro mode. At times, it is good to add a conversion macro lens on the front of the housing. This allows you to get more magnification and have a little more space away from the subject. Uh, this way, the subject does not get stressed and you have more room to light. These close up lenses would also be used on macro lenses to get images of subject larger than the life. So this is called super macro. Shooting macro subjects that don't move is a good way to start and practice your lighting. And small, fast moving fish take some skills and some luck to get the image of. In many cases, you end up shooting straight into the subject or shooting down when shooting tiny macro subjects. Here, I was able to get low and shoot up on this anemone fish. And in this close-up pattern of water, I use sight lighting for the texture. Same on this close-up of a sea fan. Now, what if we're shooting large subjects? Well, when you're shooting large subjects, you need to use wide angle lenses to get very close. And even the subject has big, sharp teeth. Fish eye lenses that have an angle of view of 180 degrees work really well underwater. That is why the Takina 10 to 17 millimeter lens with an angle of view of 180 to 100 degrees is very popular. Uh, this camera is for, uh, this lens is for cameras with APS-C size sensors only. Rectilinear wide angle lenses have an angle of view around 114 degrees also work well for large subjects. These lenses will have less distortion, especially when shooting shipwrecks. This photo was shot with a Panasonic 8 millimeter fisheye and an Olympus Macro for the for Thoughts uh, camera. The distortion added to the composition. I photographed the same subject from the same distance with the rectilinear Olympus 9 to 18 millimeter wide angle lens. Notice the tighter angle of view and less distortion. So when using wide angle or fisheye lenses, you need to use a dome port. This will correct the 25% larger and closer uh, size distortion. You could use a four inch uh, dome for fish eyes and since they produce a curved image. For rectilinear lenses, the larger the dome, the better the edge sharpness. You might also need an extension between the uh, dome and the housing. And if you have a zoom lens, you're going to need a ring on the lens to control the zoom. So here's another example of a rack image with a fish eye lens. As you can see, that it's curved and it shows the big size and it kind of works well with this image. So how do we know what port extension and ring is needed? All housing manufacturers have a chart listing supported lenses and what is needed. If the lens is not on the chart, it means it has not been tested. You really should use a listed lens. When using a point and shoot, you should use a housing that allows you to use a conversion lens. The lenses get added to the housing and could be put on or off in the water. Some are just wide lenses, like this one from Icolite. There are also some conversion domes. This allows the built-in lens on the camera to have the same angle of view underwater as above water. The best wide angle lenses to use have a lens to widen the angle of view and it's built into a dome like this one from Fantasy.
to create over and under shots, it is the best to use a very wide lens in a dome. You want the subject to be interesting above and below the water. And wide angle lenses should be used for large marine life. It does take skill to get close. Wide lenses are also very efficient when shooting shipwrecks. Could also use them for a silhouette shot. And this could be very effective, like this one, in the blue hold of Dahab in Egypt. And as well as this one in Cenotes in the Yucatan in Mexico. So now I want to talk about light. White light is made up of all the colors of the spectrum. The co color of light is measured in Kelvin. The lower the number, the warmer the light. Fluorescent light will cause uh, images to go green. It's like zombies. So this is important because the deeper we go, um, the warmer colors start to disappear and the images get cold. As a photographer, we need usually to correct that color. Using filters is a simple way to correct color. Red filters corrects blue water and magenta filters correct green water. So water does act like a blue or green filter. Some images, like this one, look good with no color correction. And filters affect the background and foreground, which flatters out the image. We also cannot separate the, the background and foreground exposures. So when you use strobe, you could separate the ambient light background and the front strobe light exposure. This will create a more dramatic image. And we like to use the CNC YS01 and the YS G3 strobes because they have a powerful a power dial that is very convenient. Icolite strobes use a sync cord and will work TTL auto mode with some Icolite housings. Here we have the Icolite um, DS160, which is their top of the line. The 161 is the same stroke, but they add a video light and the more economical DS51. CNC YS03 stroke is low cost, but out exposure only. Sea Life produces a low cost stroke, but manual exposure only. Diffusers create soft light and should be used most of the time. So we shoot in manual mode. Uh, the shutter speed affects ambient exposure, but not the strobe exposure. In this photo, I use a slow shutter speed which, uh, to show the uh, bright background. Now, changing the aperture will affect ambient and strobe exposure. Most of the time, we leave the aperture alone. This is why we use strobes that we could change the power setting to get the proper exposure on the subject. This is easier than moving the strobes closer or farther away from the subject. And this photo was shot during the day and Larry got a back background by using a fast shutter speed. Now, how do we make sure the flash fires the same time the shutter opens? Uh, some housings use a sync cord. They have a hot shoe connector inside the housing. There is a bulkhead on the outside of the housing for the waterproof sink cord to plug into. And some housings have two bulkheads to use the two sink cords for two strobes. Strobe also has bulkhead for cord to put in. Another system are fiber optic cables and this will move the light from the camera's built-in flash to a slave trigger on the strobe. Using uh, the camera's flash as a trigger does use the camera's battery and recycling time is slower. Some systems use an LED trigger. This does not use the battery and you do not have to wait for the trigger to recycle. This could also be used on cameras that do not have a built-in flash. Flex arms are easy to use, but they have limited positioning. Ball, ball joint arms are more flexible, harder to use, and they are more expensive. Clamps are used to hold arm sections together, 
and triple clamps could be used to put a strobe next to a video light. On a point and shoot camera, you need to attach the tray to the camera and then the arm to the tray. On larger housings, the arms go attached to the handles on the housing. In the film Nikonos days, photographers would hold the strobe in one hand and then a tiny Nikonos camera in the other. For this reason, Icolite came up with a quick release system and they still use this on their housings today. Here I am using flex arms that have ball connection. Notice triple clamps holding a video light next to a strobe on each side. Here's our friend Mike using a ball joint arm set up with iron strobes. So Olga, how did you start out? Well, I started very simple. I started shooting with a small Canon Elf point and shoot camera in Uncolite housing with one continuous LED light. From there, Olga moved up to a point and shoot camera with manual control. She got very nice images with a $600 camera, $400 housing, but she did have $4,000 worth of lights attached. So on my first dive trip, uh, we see gypsies to Bonaire. I had very little gear and rented most of it. My friend Jeannie said, one day you will have hundreds of pounds of gear. I said, no way but she was so right. Another thing that could be useful, especially for macro, is to use a focus light. This will help the camera focus in dark areas. The focus light should be mounted above the port, and the best focus lights have a sensor, so when your strobes fire, the light goes out so it does not affect the image. Now, strobe positioning is as important as exposure in all photography. When shooting macro, bring the strobes in close. Feather the strobe heads out to use the soft edge of the light. When using one strobe, you could put it above the port and feather the head up. So in this macro photo, the strobes are in close. I used a fast shutter speed to get a dark background. Besides using a fast shutter speed, it is a good idea to use a large aperture number. Uh, depth of field is very shallow when shooting close. And at times, you could still open up the aperture to throw the background out of focus. In this image, Olga used an aperture to keep the subject and foreground sharp. But the background is nice and soft. When you focus two thirds towards the back of the image, this will increase depth of field. When I took the group shot of juvenile saltwater catfish, I used flat lighting so they did not blend together. I decided to do a close up to show detail. I used side lighting to get highlights on their whiskers. If you remember earlier, we said diffusers should be used all the time, but rules are made to be broken. To get a spotlight effect, I took off the diffusers to get a smaller beam angle. Instead of feathering the lights out, I pointed them in at the subject to cause a uh, tighter beam. So when using one stroke, position it at 45 degree angle and up high. There will be a shot on the other side, so use one strobe if you have a low budget or one strobe stops working. I did this photo of a moray eel with one strobe. My strobe arm broke, so it was easier just to use one than to try to carry the other strobe in. Again, we talked about it that everything looks 25% close on the water. Many new photographers position their strobes to light up where they see the subject. And that is not what the subject is. So they light up the water column. So this could cause a back scatter. You need to bring your strobes out to the side and feather them out. This way you are lighting with the soft edge of the light and this way you're also lighting the subject, not the water column. 
Again, everything looks 25% close underwater. You need to pull the strokes back 25% to light up where the subject e really is and not where you see it. You also have to move close. There are still particles, and the closer you are, the less particles there are between your port and your subject. And do not forget to shoot vertical images. The composition might be better, and many publications need vertical images. You do need to change the stroke position. You could set up the strokes like this, and feather the lower stroke down and the upper stroke up. Or here's another stroke configuration for shooting vertical images. When I shot this vertical image, my top stroke tilted down to light the porthole opening. I used a slower shutter speed to capture the ambient light streaming into the wreck. I was lucky, the fish in the background became a silhouette. So in this photo at Dutch Springs, Pennsylvania, I used the strobe on the low power, the top strobe, uh, to fill in the shadows. The bottom strobe was on a high power to light up the underwater part of the images, and especially this very uh, interesting uh, orange uh, fins of my good friend. Now, LED continuous lights are used to capture video, but we could also use them as a backlight or as a prop when shooting stills. Some LED lights have a red or blue beam. This blue beam could be used with a barrier filter over the lens to capture fluorescence. To photograph fluorescence images, you need to shoot at night or in a very dark space. Here is another fluorescent image. And the blue beam that is really for photographing fluorescent images could be used as a good prop. The red beam is really for night dives, so this way you do not scare shy marine life. Uh, being the model in this photo, I used it to highlight the koi. Now, here I'm shooting inside a rack, and Olga was shooting not far away from me and her uh, focus light became a, uh, a backlight for this image. Even with a bright background, you can see the LED light aimed direct into the lens. Now for larger subjects, light should be spread out and feathered out so you can actually lit up well the whole uh, subject. This is an underwater landscape. I used the shutter speed to expose for the ambient light coming through the opening in the reef. I set my strobes to light up the sponge. Uh, since the subject wasn't moving, I had plenty of time to adjust both my strobes and ambient light exposure. Dutch Springs uh, in Pennsylvania is a great place to practice underwater lighting. I used a fast shutter speed because the ambient light was very bright. It was a sunny, beautiful day. The light is behind my model Larry, so he was in the shadow. I used my strobes to fill in the shadows. The historical dive equipment working group meets at Dutch Springs every Memorial and Labor Day weekend. They did not meet this past weekend. Uh, this is a great photo opportunity and it's a lot of fun to photograph everybody in hard hat. Uh, here, I changed the color of the photo in Photoshop. I took advantage of good visibility and used available light. This is effective for many large subjects. And while shooting inside the plane, I used a slow shutter speed to expose the ambient light coming through the window. I also, use the, uh, my strokes to light up the cockpit. The platforms at Dutch are really for training. Olga is photographing me under the platform, using it as a filter in front of the sun, and that caused the light rays. Larry used portrait lighting technique just like in the studio. There was a main light and fill light for the shadows. 
Schnell's window is a phenomenon by which an underwater viewer sees everything above the surface through a cone of light. This phenomenon is called by refraction of light entering the water. The window is round, but in this photo, the round part is blocked by the structure. We run an underwater photography workshop at Dutch Springs for the Sea Gypsies members. We do not know if this is going to happen this season or not. So during the workshop, we have very cooperative subjects like this bus to practice our lighting. And when on a reef, try to start practicing lighting with a coil head that does not move. There is really good wreck diving off the New Jersey and Long Island coast. On the wreck of the stole, I used strobes to highlight Olga's face behind the wreckage. I used the slow shutter speed to create a bright green background, even at 130 feet off New, Jer New Jersey waters. Uh, here I used a little faster shutter speed to get a medium green background. Uh, this wreck photo was shot in Lake Ontario. Snorkeling uh, last summer of Montauk, we were looking for blue sharks. Being close to the surface, Larry used ambient light to get the highlights reflecting on the shark. I decided to use strokes so I could use a faster shutter speed. This gave me a darker background and a more dramatic photo. You do not need to be a diver to do this trip. You just need to be comfortable in the water. And I guess comfortable with sharks, Being right? around sharks. <laughs> yeah, but if you're not comfortable, you could use the shark cage. Uh, blue sharks are not aggressive. We did not use the shark cage. So besides the blue sharks, we saw maker sharks. We saw minke and humpback whales. And we also saw the smaller molar. So we got really all the marine life that we, we could only uh, dream of on a one day of diving and snorkeling. So when you're taking photos of sharks, the strobes will be at a higher angle to light the darker top area and not burn out the lighter underside of the shark. So while shooting inside the shipwreck, I used a slow shutter speed to expose the ambient light coming through the opening in the ceiling. I turned the stroke out down to avoid burning out the, on the side of the shark. As you know, you know, as you could see, it's in a very uh, pale white color. So you have to be very careful not to expose it. And I used the same technique in this photo. And the shark was actually surrounded by the shiny bait fish, which made it a little bit more challenging because the bait fish is like, a, like a small pieces of a bright mirror and it makes it very difficult to properly light up uh, the, the, the shark and the fish. Olga used the fast shutter speed to get a black background to create a shark portrait. Now, since the shark is close to the wreck ceiling, the strobes lit up the shark and the details in the ceiling. In this photo, I used a lighted carefully to every, you know, evenly light up the sharks in foreground, middle, and background. While shooting inside a shipwreck, Olga used a slow shutter speed to expose the ambient light coming through the opening. Strobes lit up the blackfish, having an intimate moment on the sunken toilet. In this photo, my strobes lit up the inside of the uh, shipwreck but not the model outside the wreck. And here the strobes lit up the shaft way inside the, uh, the wreck and the model because the model was leaning forward. Same here, the strobes are lighting up the inside and Olga is in the hatchway. So Larry, who's my oldest model, is inside the wreck being lit up by my strobes. And the ambient light is coming through the openings. For that reason, I used a slow shutter speed. Besides models, it is interesting to photograph ship parts like this helm stand. The, hand, the stand is being lit by my strobes and feathered in. 
the shutter speed was set to expose for the ambient light coming inside the rack. This in interesting help is on an, an outside of the rack and was lit by Larry's strobes. They are feathered in to keep the strobe light off the rack. I experimented when I photographed this tank with and without strobes. I like the available light image the best. Not all rack shots should be white. Coming close to so interesting details, in this case, it is a mine. I came in close on this moray eel that I found uh, that found a home on a shipwreck in Kona, Hawaii. Um, let's not forget that uh, shipwrecks that are now home to marine life were tragic events. Some were caused by accidents, or in this case, caused by war. Uh, we need to be respectful and not touch or remove any remains. While diving on a shipwreck in Kona, this tourist submarine passed by. The tourists enjoyed seeing us diving as much as we enjoyed seeing them in the sub. Kona, Hawaii is famous uh, for interacting with uh, giant mantas at night. We snorkeled with mantas a few times off the beach. We used triple clamps to hold the video light next to our strobe on each side of the housing. The video slides were pointed up to attract plankton, which attracts the mantis. The strokes were spread out wide to capture images of this magnificent fish. A focus light was mounted above the dome to help the camera focus in low light. We also did a night manta dive off a boat. The boat's crew put lights on a float and in the sand to attract the mantas. We still used our video lights to attract plankton and have the mantas come in close to us. Not far from sh the shore, the water gets extremely deep in Kona. For this reason, Kona is a good place for black water diving. This is a special kind of night dive over deep oceanic water. We used weighted uh, downlines tied to the boat. We were attached to the downline via, uh, via shorter tether wearing a harness. The idea is to photograph deep water marine light coming shallow to fit. This was our first black water experience. Now, there are interesting flooded caves in, the, in Mexico, in the Mexican Yucatan. The cave zone is known as cenotes, and they have some really interesting ambient light effects. Some photographers uh, just uh, use available light. We expose for available light, but still use our strokes and the low power to fill in the shadows. The strobe light will fill in the shadows and give us detail in the foreground. You do have to be careful that the strobe light does not wash out the ambient light effect. I aim the strobes up to the light to light up the stalactites. The open water area of the cenote was covered with algae. The sun created shadows of the trees and I was able to capture those shadows from underwater. Now, we keep talking about balancing the ambient light to our strobe light. But well, once you leave the cavern and go into the cave zone, there is no ambient light to balance. Here, I used a slave strobe attached to the model's tanks. It's aimed back towards the back. This way, it backlit the subject for separation. Exiting a cave, I saw open water. This gave me a warm and fuzzy feeling after being in total darkness for a long time. The shutter was set to expose for the open water. You could even see the ladder all the way in the background and strobes lit the stalactite. Inside this small uh, cave, uh, Larry was in the cave shooting towards open water to get the silhouette of me. His strobe power was set low to bring out shadow detail. In this photo, the diver is far away in the background. So it's silhouetted in the green water. 
strobes lit up the strawberry anemones in the foreground. Now, curious sea lions make great subjects. They're easy to get close to, but they also move really fast. So I had to use a fast shutter speed to stop the action of Olga taking a photograph of this little sea lion. So when working in a shallow water, I needed to close the aperture and use a fast shutter speed. This way the ambient light does not wash out the strobe light. Here again, I use side lighting to get highlights on the bubble. The sea lion is uh, just having fun playing. Here I use composition and lighting layers. The ground was lit up with ambient light and the sea lion in the background. The wall and front sea lion were lit up by my strobes. Now we move to the cold green waters of Alaska. Using layered lighting, the front large anemones and Olga are lit by my strobes. The ambient light has a gradation because the sun is behind the wall. So in this case, strobes lit the gray rockfish and the wall. I use a fast shutter speed to get a black background. The walls in British Columbia are covered with rich life of all sizes, including this new debris. It's so hard to decide what lens to take on a dive. Also in BC, you could find giant Pacific octopus. We were lucky that this one was out during the day. I was set up for Makra in, in British Columbia when I photographed this cute little fish not knowing what it was. The captain told us it was a juvenile wolf eel. This is what they look like when they grow up. They do not age well. I hope I age better than that. I would hope that too. <laughs> I'm sure you do. Uh, this is, uh, there's plenty of large marine life in these cold nutrient rich waters. Uh, this huge lingcod was just sitting on a rock looking like a dinosaur. So from cold waters, we're going down to the warm waters of Cuba. I was shooting up using available light to get the silhouette. I got nice highlights on the water, and the shark was in the shadows, but the white sand bottom acted like a reflector. I photographed the same subject at the same angle, but I decided to use strokes to fill in the shadows. When you include a sun ball as part of the composition, you need to cover the brightest part of the sun with the subject. And I used a small aperture and fast shutter speed. This way I did not overexpose the image. And I, as in the previous uh, folder, I used the same technique. Uh, when I was shooting this uh, boat uh, on a surface, I changed my position uh, for this photo a few times because the boat was moving with the waves. And this way, I did not overexpose the sun ball. We love diving close to home and far away. In 2018, we had the opportunity to spend a month in Papua New Guinea. Uh, this is a very special place because the marine life is very diverse including many different anemone fish. So when photographing the anemone fish, you could also include the colorful anemone. We also saw very colorful nudibranchs and interesting eels like this blue ribbon eel. And being observant, uh, I spotted this camouflage crocodile fish bladed into the reef. I used sight lighting to get the fish to separate from uh, the ground. And on the reef, we saw a variety of sharks, including this silver cheek shark. I used an eight millimeter fish eye lens, so I captured the distortion as the shark came in close, he smacked me in the face with his tail and turned away. To wake you up? He did wake me up. So, in Papua New Guinea, the seascapes on Gabriela's fish point are breathtaking. The majestic wall was covered with growth and teemed with life. I moved in close on the granular sea star 
to use the force perspective of my fish lens, fish eye lens. I also positioned my guide further back so he would be silhouetted. So when it comes to underwater photography, what could go wrong will go wrong. That's why we always bring plenty of backup gear. Uh, the problem is nowadays traveling on planes with all this gear is getting much harder and also much more expensive. So what we want to end this with is there really are no rules. We should learn lighting concepts and then experiment. Digital allows us to shoot thousands of frames on a single dive and we could take a look right away at what we shot and then reshoot. It is good to connect with other underwater photographers to learn from each other. In New York City, we have the New York City Sea Gypsy Scuba Club. The club has been active since 1971, long history. Part of the Sea Gypsies is New York Underwater Photographic Society. The gypsies, uh, uh, so gypsies have monthly meeting with speakers about all sorts of underwater topics. At New York EPS, meeting photographers have an opportunity to share the images and the techniques. There is New York City uh, Sea Gypsies and New York City uh, UPS Facebook pages. And during this time, we are now having meetings on Zoom. So here's our websites where you could see more of our work. Um, if you have questions on underwater gear, you could email me at bnh at uw at bhphoto.com. And we want to thank everybody for logging in. And Derek, we could take questions now. Let me get rid of the screen share so we could see everybody. There we go, and I'm back. No, thank you guys for a wonderful, interesting, it was like sucked in, like trance-like at, at okay. points. So did that all go, um, we felt like we were talking to ourselves since we no. couldn't see <laughs> I know, it's, on. it's definitely a different format. It's like when you're, when you're used to interacting live and even just hearing people say, uh-huh. Oh yeah. Oh, I like that. <laughs> like when, when you suck all the sound out of it and, and video and everything, it, but it really allows you, especially for something like this, it, it allows you to, to get in the moment. Cause a lot of the, the appreciation of underwater photography is just allowing it to take your mind somewhere else. Well, that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to take people on a journey, but still kind of tell them what they need to get started and what to, they need to know and do to create these kind of images. Yeah, and I think with the lighting is, is what I found the most interesting. Um, and it's funny, as I go in to say that, we just had a question come in about the lighting um, because I, I think people see these underwater images and I still don't think they fully appreciate how difficult it is to do what you guys do. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and, and how difficult it is to light underwater, especially when you're talking about deep sea it's not like we're talking about going into the bathtub and clear water you know you're going into a lot of these murky deep depths where visibility <clears throat> is zero especially up here and that's also part of getting close because in you know it's not that bad we have some really good days in the northeast but we also some have some days where we know we're on the shipwreck when our head hits it and yet we'll still try to provide produce some images for that now, we had a question come in. It's funny, I was wondering the same thing as you're showing these images. Um, how do you meter? Do you guys carry a light meter? Is there an underwater light meter? Do, do you guess or is it trial and error? It's more trial and error. Okay. Um, we kind of meter the ambient light and we usually want to underexpose the ambient light. But again, depending on what, how light or dark we want that background, we'll change that. As far as the strobe exposure, um, some people do shoot TTL uh, auto. Uh, some systems do support that. The problem is, is, well, TTL works pretty good on macro images, but when you're shooting wide images with a lot of negative space, it gets full. So we find in general, it's better to shoot manual. And we pretty much know how close we are on where to set our strobe power. But again, unlike with film, if we're overexposed, we could then turn the power down or turn the power up. 
Now, there, does, no, go ahead, go ahead, Larry. I was going to say there actually used to be underwater light meters, but they've all been discontinued. Okay. Now, does refraction play play a role in that? Is it something where refraction is causing a major disturbance to what you're doing, or? Well, the refraction or the way light enters water is why everything looks 25% larger and closer. So as we said, we do have to keep that in mind. So we're lighting our subject and not lighting the water with all the particles in the water in front. Just get close as, far, you know, as, far, as much as you can, <laughs> that simple one. <laughs> I know, you guys make it sound so easy and then half of the pictures are like things that I wouldn't go within 20 feet of, so. <laughs> <laughs> I know everybody's sitting there watching it. They're like, oh, hell no. I'm not going near that thing. Give me a cage. <laughs> um, how do you guys practice when you're out of the water? I mean, it's not something that you can exactly just walk down the street and say, hey, I'm going to go jump in an ocean right now. Well, I, you know, you do practice uh, on the land as well, because um, personally, I do a lot of uh, cityscapes uh, uh, photography and uh, birds photography. And it's also about your, um, the way you react when you see something because underwater, uh, the fish aren't gonna wait for you. It just swims by or shark or turtle. So you have to be ready to be take a shot. Uh, so just going out and take photos in the city, people, you know, photos of people or birds is, is, is very good practice. And like we said before in, the, in our presentation, we have Dutch Springs, Pennsylvania. There's a lake where we go pretty much every weekend. Uh, we, if we're not going to go out, they're to the, open. yeah, when they're open, not like <laughs> not, not this time, unfortunately. The ocean, yeah. So that's why we go, you know, we go in and practice again. They have all kinds of uh, submerged uh, um, objects. They have uh, boats. They have you know cars and trams and all kinds of and planes. And that's where we actually practice a wide angle uh, photography. Now we uh, had. I'm going to add a little bit to that, but what it, what Olga is basically saying: the more you practice photography the better it's gonna be and the more comfortable. It's important to know your camera and your camera controls, even in total darkness. And occasionally we'll put the cameras in the housing and play with them on the surface. So this way we know what those controls feel like and seem to be in the housing as well. And also uh, most photographers do not travel as often as we do. I know because it's budget and they do not have many vacational days. So I always say that if you have only two trips in a year, you better practice for those two uh, no, trips whole year because you will really need that uh, practice to be you know, using the water. So they yeah, do not have a 50 foot tank in the back of the yard. <laughs> That's what no, we're getting at. We wish. No. <laughs> we wish. Yeah. We were we'll thinking work. of putting one basement of 440 there where the store is i think there, we have there you go look if, if you would like to see a a full deep sea diving underwater photography tank at b h just write in or we should find friends who have uh, swimming pools <laughs> there you go now we had a couple comments come in on backscatter okay and uh scattering so how do you what's your best hint to avoid scattering and someone noticed that there is no scatter in any of the shots was that something that was filtered out after let me start that. I'll start that. A lot of the issue with backscatter is the positioning of the lights. Again, the reason why a lot of people get backscatter is because they're putting their strobes, or in the case of video, their LED lights, uh, where they think the subject is. So what they're doing is they're lighting the water. They're not lighting the subject. So by making sure you kind of, and this takes more experience, that you're lighting 25% back where the subject is instead of the water column. That's gonna help with backscatter. And there are some tricks in Photoshop, just in case that didn't quite work out, or if you're in a very silty environment. Because you gotta remember, when we're in Dutch Springs with the uh, hard hat divers, those guys aren't neutrally buoyant. They're walking on that bottom and silt is kicking up all over the place. So there are some tricks in Photoshop to do uh, uh, some backscatter removal afterwards. Obviously we try to get the images close to perfect so we don't have to work as much on the computer. 
Okay. Now, in settings wise, um, someone asked about the maximum ISO. If it's something where there's a maximum ISO where you kind of cap it. I know outside of the water, it's with the technology now you can go into the six figures on ISO. Does that change underwater at all? It doesn't really, but well, it, you know, it does. It doesn't really. But remember, we're shooting strobes, so there's no most of the time we're shooting mm -hmm. strobes. So there's no reason for us to raise the really IS. Well, so you're not really, um, yeah, you're not pulling on ambient light and balancing so much as you're, you're really lighting your scene completely right. with the strobe. But we do want the ambient light for the background. So if we're deep and we're in off New Jersey or in the Great Lakes and it's particularly dark, I'll push the ISO maybe up to 800. The other thing with what Olga and I shoot, and again, you saw how much stuff we travel with, and we still kind of keep that down by using um, Olympus Micro Four Thirds cameras and Olympus and the smaller lenses, so that helps. But because of the smaller sensor, we're still getting very good image quality, but we don't want to push that ISO too high because of the noise. Okay. Um, we have a question on the underwater photography certification. Is that a substitute for practicing with the pros like Sea Gypsy, or is it a necessary course to take? Uh, neither one of us has ever taken a class uh, <laughs> for the certification. So, I mean, the uh, training agencies do have a certification for photography, and I think how good that is just really depends on the instructor. So I've seen a number of um, badge, people who collect badges uh, do an underwater photo class where they really did not learn very much. Um, at the same time, it's good to take a class. There are some places that do a good job. We keep saying we're gonna start running trips and doing classes. So maybe once we could actually start traveling again, We'll do that. Okay. And S Steve wants to know, he remembers fondly, it looks like, the good old days of Q-tips in Greece and studying the seal area um, prior to, to submerging. So has sealing the unit prior to the dive been made any easier? Is there any technology? Is it still a grueling process? You still have to grease the O-rings and be more and be careful not to add too, too much. much grease and be careful. Now, a lot of housing manufacturers now do have uh, vacuum seals and vacuum tests. So this also, like seeing daylight after being in the cave for an hour and a half, gives you a nice warm feeling when you see that light blinking, knowing that you pumped all the air out of the housing, and if there's no air in the housing, there's no water going to get in the housing. Of course, you have a really awful feeling when that light goes red and it starts beeping at you, knowing that air is getting in that housing and you need to get that housing out of the water before water comes that's, in. That's in your uh, aquatic housing. You have the pot. Well, right? a lot of them now have it. You Aquatica it. has it. So, Fantasy has it. But in mine, well, it's, your older housing, yeah, you well, don't have. So the I don't pump. have the pump to seal the the housing, but I have the alarm. So in case water leaked into my housing, I will hear an alarm, and I would see the light flash. Um, okay. Depending, I would say housings in general are not, they could flood and floods happen, but they're not as prone to floods as the old Nikonoses. The old Nikonos uh, cameras, and I flooded at least three of them. Um, <laughs> yeah, if there was, Wow. Even the tiniest hair on the O-ring, it would be gone. So you had to make sure it was very clean, et cetera. You still have to do that, but um, many of the housings today are also double O-ring sealed. So if one fails, the other one should have be a backup. Okay. And I, what I noticed that when you dive in a very shallow water with a lot of sand, and that's actually uh, a chance for you to get flooded because the sand particles really get into your housing, no matter what. So you have to be, after every dive, sh uh, uh, shallow dive, you have to be, you know, clean up the O-ring and make sure it's all clean up. Right. 
or shallow dive or diving from the from the beach. Yeah, from a beach. Yeah. That's usually a, yeah, yeah. an issue. Well, Larry, you just made Coach Jan feel much better. Coach Jan has only flooded one. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and we're we're not going to ask him if those were B and H loners. Okay, and we're and also <laughs> also I talked about the cameras. I have flooded one housing as much as I said housings are hard and a number of strobes and lights. But if you, you've been diving for 30 years, right? Since 89. So yeah. it's, I would say one housing flooded, you know, flooded housing per, yeah. ten, uh, per decade, it's not bad. Yeah. It's not bad. That's not too bad. No. Just remind, I'm not letting you ever borrow my camera gear, Larry, just know that. <laughs> you shouldn't say that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's not bad, but when it happens, especially when it happens, and you know, we, we try, bring backups for as much as possible mm -hmm. but it's always the one item you forgot or did not pack extra of that gets I mean I, I can it's imagine it's one of those things where you don't know you're in trouble until you're already in trouble and it's like man. yeah it is a very expensive mistake yeah very expensive I, I can imagine well you guys you guys covered it all I mean I, I learned a lot you, you almost made me want to put on 100 pounds of gear and go diving in the ocean <laughs> well you could just snorkel come out to mind yes. talk yeah in, the, in the there shark. we go larry i'm gonna i'm gonna take you up on it one day i'm gonna i'm gonna tag along one day and uh okay i'm gonna have i'll, I'll keep it simple i'll bring one of the little underwater disposables yes no, okay you could there, do, we go. there are actually besides aquatech there are uh a few more housings for phones too so people are taking their phones underwater to take images that's another option as well. Well, that that was awesome. We thank you guys for for coming in and joining us, Larry. It's it's not the same as being able to walk by you in the hallway, but I guess you know <laughs> this will do. But no, well, you know, at least we're doing it this way. We do miss talking actually in the event space. I, um, I promise, I owe you one. Okay. okay. <laughs> when when we get things back and we're back live then uh, we'll definitely get you guys live in the event space. It, it'll be nice. To, you know, I think I'm going to lay out in, across four chairs next time I get in there. I'm like, you never know <laughs> how much you appreciated that little room. And we want to see those, lots of those BNH candies around. There, I know. Yeah, th <laughs> this is the one thing. I haven't, I haven't figured out how to make Zaza's virtual. So. <laughs> but I'm saving, I'm saving all of our viewers' cavities right now. Mm -hmm. so, exactly. exactly we're good oh, this is a great platform any way to do it and i'm sure that we have people from all over that would not be able to come to the store so exactly it's the same thing with our uh, dive club meetings we got people participating that would normally not come in so yeah it's definitely i mean it's it's using technology to an advantage which is always a good thing yeah so on behalf of the rest of the B&H family, uh, we thank you guys. We'll definitely, we'll get you back. Hey, if you guys want to do another Zoom, we'll do another Zoom and, and we'll we get you back in that. person. We, we could do something that's more or less technical with the equipment and more travel, uh, 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 travel oriented either with there Zoom. If you remember, we started trying to plan this for the event space live. Exactly. Who would have thought that we'd be doing this? I know, uh, we went from high definition screens to uh, webcams. Yeah, exactly. Well, <laughs> well, no, again, this was great. I learned a lot, some beautiful images. Thank you guys both for sharing your insight and your time with us. We will uh, we'll definitely get you back in the future. On behalf of everybody out there who's watching, wanted to personally thank you, Larry and Olga. Uh, we'll get you guys back for everyone tuning in uh, live. Thank you guys for joining. Without you guys, we don't have a show. So <laughs> we will catch you guys next time on another rendition of the B&H virtual event space. I am your host, Derek Fosmeter. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks so much. Good night. Thank you.